morning, everyone, and I know the schedule got a little bit rearranged, but here we are. Uh, I'm very pleased to be talking with Commissioner Robert Jackson of the SEC, and obviously there is a lot to discuss. Uh, Robert, if I can call you Robert, is one of the, the crucial figures in, the, in market regulation, and there's a lot to talk about. Uh, I know many members of the audience will be itching to talk about cryptocurrency, but I'm going to start with a topic that's a little closer to to my own interests, uh, you've written a great deal in about securities markets and issues of fairness and equity. You've talked about low competition and market makers charging rents, issues like public versus private feeds and broker rebates. This is a technology conference. Mm -hmm. Do you think technology can help us solve some of those problems you see in security markets, or is this purely a regulation problem that needs to be solved by better and clearer regulation? Oh, so I, I think technology uh, really is the key to solving these problems. So first of all, thanks so much um, for having me. Thanks so much, Rob, for, for moderating. I am delighted to have the chance to talk with this group. I feel like if you're in this room, you're on the cutting edge of the questions we're gonna be talking about, and that's why I wanted uh, to be here. Um, let me answer your question directly. I think a lot of the issues that plague our capital markets today can be solved, will be solved by technology. And the mm -hmm. question isn't if they will be solved uh, by technology, the question is when. So let me give a specific example. Um, when I was, uh, before I became a regulator, um, I was an investment banker. Uh, I was at Bear Stearns uh, back in the day. Not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I pitched IPOs in 1998, 1999, and 2000. That was my job. I raised money. And when I did that, we had a fee that we charged to take companies public. And it was 7% of the value of the firm. It was not 7.5%. It was not 6.5%. It was 7% on the nose. And I remember being an investment banker. My, my recollection was that um, at the time, I didn't have an iPhone. I had a pager um, when I would uh, go pitch IPOs. And I remember thinking, technology is going to solve this problem. And by the time I become you know, more senior in the firm, we're not going to charge 7% because people are going to compete over taking companies public. So I got to the SEC about a year ago, and I had my economists run a study. I said, I'd like to know what the fees are for taking companies public in this country. And they took a look at the data, and it turns out if you take your company public today and you raise less than a billion dollars, if you're not Facebook, you pay 7%. Everything in America has gotten cheaper. Phones, technology has advanced on every possible front except for going public. That's proof to me that we still have a long way to go in the ways technology can help us um, with our capital markets. And, my, and, my, and it was years ago when Google tried to subvert some of that process with its own offering and do its own auction and cut some of the, the high fee bankers out. Yep. But it didn't work. That's exactly right. Um, what Rob <coughs> is referring to is back in 2004, Google took a very different approach to their IPO process. And a lot of people hoped, myself included, that that might lead to some change. But I don't need to tell all of you that the interests in finance that want to collect those fees are entrenched <laughs> yeah. and powerful. And that kind of change takes time. But I don't think you, it's credible to tell American investors that an IPO should cost the same amount today and we should use the same process for going public today that we did in 1998. And because eventually technology will provide those solutions, it's going to be easier for companies to go public and raise capital. And in my view, that's the future of finance. Mm. And so how do you release competition not only among investment banking firms, but up among market making firms that, uh, that is, is another uh, deadweight cost, as it were, that investors have to pay. Yeah, well, one of the most astonishing things that I've noticed in my time at the SEC is the state of our stock markets. So here's an interesting fact about American stock markets. Um, there are 13 public lit, what are called public stock exchanges in the United States, which makes it sound like there's a lot of competition, right? I mean, 13 competitors for, you know, these days in America, that's a lot of competition. Yes. Of those 13, 12 of them are owned by three conglomerates. Now, it is a very interesting business model for a former M&A banker for you to buy all the competition in your industry and keep running those businesses. That's a strange thing. Usually what you do is consolidate yeah. them. You shut them down, economies of scale and scope and such. But in our stock markets, what happened is the exchanges continued to operate those, small, those smaller lit exchanges. And the reason is because investors pay fees to access, to connect, to get data from those exchanges. And those fees are extremely profitable for the exchanges. Yes, and they're duplicative. Exactly. You have to pay for each one. Exactly. Yeah. So one of the, I, when I got to my job, I sort of looked at the state of the stock market and said, given the technology we have, and given that we are the most 
the deepest, most liquid capital markets in the world, is this really the best we can do mm. in terms of the kinds of competition we want to see on things like the fees that are charged investors? I'm very proud of the fact that we at the SEC have for the first time pushed back on stock exchanges trying to raise those fees. Mm. I mean, after all, it's called the Securities and Exchange Commission. We're supposed to oversee what the exchanges do. And for years, we more or less gave uh, approval to almost anything they wanted to do. But last year, for the first time, we took off the kid gloves. <clears throat> and we forced them to show that competition was leading them to increase prices, not their market power. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very proud of that work, and it's still ongoing. We're doing a lot to make sure exchanges have to prove that they're adding value for investors. Are there other things you think the SEC, or for that matter, uh, matter other regulators can do to improve the, to turn up the dial on competition in markets? Yes, so a couple of quick things about that. First of all, we are doing at the SEC an experiment I'm re very proud of. It's called the transaction fee pilot. Mm -hmm. And what we're studying is the, the fees that are paid to certain market participants for bringing their business to a particular exchange. And here's what I like about that. It's a data-driven project. Mm. We're not speculating about whether the fees are good or bad. We're experimenting to see how they affect liquidity. And using those data, we may or may not make the policy changes that folks have been calling for. I think the answer to your question is, given the technology we have, it's, the big data is so powerful. We have a responsibility as regulators to let the facts drive our choices. Mm. So that's a project that we're doing. We announced it uh, a few months. It's subject to litigation, uh, so I can't say too much more. But I'm very proud of it, and I expect that it's going to move forward soon. Um, I know that you at the SEC, in cooperation with the Financial Stability Oversight Council, have been having a close look at what happened in the markets in December. Mm. And we, we had a pretty rocky couple of weeks there in the equity market. And there are still a lot of questions about whether quant funds, uh, automated trading, all of that contributed to the market turbulence. Have you come to any conclusions? Have any thoughts? Give us an update on what you found uh, in the kind of anti-market events part, part of your job. Sure. So. This is, a, a re, this is an area where technology has allowed us to do things we could never have done before. Um, so when we study a market event at the SEC, we have tremendous staff who are able to dive into the data and try and figure out what happened. Like, for example, in December, when people were moving toward quality and out of um, certain kinds of securities, what market makers stepped up, which ones didn't, why and how did their exit affect the rest of the market? I'm sure it was the same market makers who always step up. <laughs> None of them. <laughs> Yeah, that's what market makers do for a living. Yes. Yeah, no, I, so I, I think fundamentally, the answer to your question is we're able to understand this in a way we couldn't mm. because we have big data at our disposal. Now, here's one thing I want to say about this. You guys remember the flash crash a few years back. Um, after the flash crash, we, uh, the SEC stepped up and said, we need a, a way to audit on a position-by-position position basis who did what in these kinds of events so we can understand what happened, why, why there was a flash crash. Uh, we announced what was called the Consolidated Audit Trail um, several years ago. It's still not complete. Um, I have to say that the chairman I work with, Jay Clayton, has done great work in pushing it forward. We have to get that stood up. Because all of you know that if something happens in the market and our answer is not, oh, we, we don't have the data to study this, you'll all be skeptical. Because we have data on everything in the world right now. And saying you don't have the data is no longer good enough. Regulators have to be able to have their hands on exactly what happened. So how close are we on the consolidated audit trail? <laughs> um, so I, I believe, my, my current sense, we have somebody we've just brought into the agency who's sort of in the job of being the cat czar. Mm. Um, and I think she's doing tremendous work. She's been pushing them forward. I'm hoping that by the end of the year, we'll have some good news on that front. And then in 2020, I think we're going to have a more complete data set we'll be able to use. Very good. Now, uh, I don't want to bring up a sensitive uh, topic, but one of your colleagues uh, a little while ago described you as a helicopter parent <laughs> when she was uh, <laughs> describing uh, your attitude towards uh, the question of whether cryptocurrencies should be regulated as securities, how they should be regulated. Um, how, how do you, uh, as, as speaking as a helicopter parent, uh, or perhaps a tiger mom, uh, how, do you, how do you respond to that point, that you've been a bit of a wet blanket in, mm. in this? Uh, no, I'm really piling on the insults, I'm sorry. But uh, <laughs> <coughs> how, how do you respond to that? Um, so for, for, first of all, uh, it just so happens I'm getting married a week from today. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Thank you. Oh, yeah. hey. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is it that surprising? No. <laughs> I'm getting married a week from today, uh, so I'm not a parent at all. Mm. 
Unless you know something I don't. Yeah. Um, the, com the comment you're referring to, it's, it's really an interesting question. It's such an exciting time to be in this room and to be at the SEC because a lot of new technologies, a lot of new ways to raise money have come before us. Mm -hmm. And the question that's being asked is what should our view be about, take for example an ETF that's gonna have as an underlying asset, cryptocurrency. Or how should I think about an ICO? And one of the things that's fun about that is we have to take principles that are 80 years old, 90 years old, and apply them to this brand new technology. Um, and we often disagree about exactly how to do that. I do have a colleague who has been sort of forthright about her view, we should um, let a thousand flowers bloom. Mm. And regulatory involvement can skew the choices markets make, et cetera. My own view, that, that's, that's true, but in, in my view, an unhelpful observation in terms of making decisions, because we fundamentally have to make choices about what Americans can and should invest in. Um, and that doesn't make us a merit regulator. That doesn't make us, we don't choose um, exactly the choices the markets make. We let the markets do that. But there are basic requirements of markets that are not yet met in, those, in, the, in some of those spaces. So you need to be able to have enough liquidity that the market can't be manipulated with a very small amount of money. You need to have enough transparency in the kinds of trading that's happen happening to make sure investors understand what they're getting. Um, you have to have enough um, market making so that you know that people are getting a fair price when they buy and sell. Um, and that's why I think we have um, not, uh, we've been forceful uh, about not approving every application that's come before us. Mm -hmm. um, we had one ETF Bitcoin proposal last year. Um, where some folks wanted to have an exchange-traded fund underlying Bitcoin, and uh, we denied the application. My colleague dissented, and those, that was in connection with some of the remarks you mentioned. But I didn't think that was a difficult case, and I'll say why. There was not a tremendous amount of transparency in the market. It was being traded overseas. Mm -hmm. There was not a lot of um, liquidity in those markets, and I didn't have the least bit of confidence that someone trading that ETF would know that they were getting the right price for what they, um, for, for uh, when they bought and sold. When the markets reach that stage, I fully believe you'll have an SEC that's ready to move forward with them. So there's nothing in the nature of a cryptocurrency, the nature of the asset itself that gives you pause. It's the structure of the markets those assets are traded in rather than features of the asset itself. Is well, that's that exactly right. That's very fair, Robin. Let me add one more. Uh, about crypto in particular, the other question we face that is very challenging is, is this a security and to what degree is it a security under the securities laws? And I think, I'll be honest, I think my colleagues have done a great job about this. Mm. Um, the director of our division of corporation finance is a man named Bill Hinman who did an, he, he gave a speech where he laid out, here's how we think about this, um, and gave a set of principles that the market can follow in understanding, here's how you know if you have a security or if you don't. Now, we haven't answered every particular question, um, but we've answered a lot. And I'll say one more thing about this. Early in this market, some lawyers out on the West Coast, mm -hmm. in my view, got out ahead of their skis. They gave advice that these things were not securities, and candidly, um, my reaction as a lawyer and human was reading the, that advice, it was uh, aggressive. Mm. As a result of that, the regulator has a job to do, which is to say to the bar, you know the principles here, you know the rules of the game, and you should apply them carefully and faithfully to the advice you're giving. And I think our, we, Hinman's speech and, and the chairman's work in this has moved the market forward a great deal. Uh, I want to talk about another application of the underlying block, blockchain technology that we haven't discussed, which is there's a lot of optimism, and I, I don't know to the degree you're concerned about this, that distributed ledger technology will make it possible to both shorten the time and expense of clearing and settling trades. Hmm. Uh, are, are clearing and settling costs and time, is that within your ambit as a regulator? And do you think that the new technologies have potential to bring, take those costs out of the market? Yes and yes. So I think, you know, one, one funny thing about uh, blockchain and the, and the technology underlying virtual currency, for example, is as a, as an admirer of technology, I think it's extraordinary, and the potential is incredible. I mean, you mentioned settlement and clearing. For sure, that will be in our ambit. But let's talk about other applications. I mean, think about its applications for audit, hmm. for tracking and dealing with voting, for smart contracting. Hmm. I mean, when you think about the power of this technology, about having objective verification of steps in a trend, it's enormously powerful. Um, and I have to be honest with you, speaking just as, a, as an observer of technology, it wasn't obvious to me the best application of this technology would be money. I mean, 
I'm cool with that. Mm. But it wasn't obvious to me that that would be the most powerful application. Um, I, I would think these other applications would be powerful. I think that what we're going to see in the next three to five years is people taking that technology and moving it to places yeah. where it can be even more powerful, like settlement clearing, for example, mm. where the days-long process it sometimes takes to clear a transaction can be shortened yeah. to not just um, hours, seconds. Yeah. And that will make our financial markets much more liquid, and I think it'll add a lot of value for investors. Very good. Um, CEOs of publicly traded companies, or Jen putting this together, are communicating in different ways. And uh, there was a, 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 a now famous back and forth last year between e Elon Musk uh, and his conversation on Twitter uh, and so forth. Now, you weren't happy with the settlement, uh, publicly unhappy with the settlement. Uh, can you lay uh, that that was reached with uh, Mr. Musk? Can you lay out some principles for us or guardrails that you think are appropriate for CEOs who are now communicating on social media uh, and uh, they don't so, show any signs of stopping either? Right. So we're going to have to think about this some more. It's a great, great question, Rob. I mean, so about you know, the particular, I can't say much about particular matters. I will say um, that what's important to me is that the legal principles we've always had in the securities markets mm. apply um, to all the sort of innovative things that are happening, including CEO communications um, by social media. And candidly, I think uh, it might be time for some guidance there. Yes. It might be time for the SEC, I'm, you know, without prejudging any particular matter, might be time for us to come forward and say, here are some principles of this game. Now, in the meantime, let me say, we have some. The principles that have always governed public communications about material information related to the firm apply to Twitter and, um, uh, and social media communications as well. And I think we've made that clear in that in other cases. Your question, which is very fair, is okay, but Twitter's a little different. Mm -hmm. It's immediate, it's informal, it can be responsive. There can be retweets, there can be a conversation um, in ways that are not contemplated by every single rule that the SEC has put out. Uh, and that's why I think you might be right that it might be time for us to step up and set some clearer rules of the game for when a CEO gets on Twitter. Yes. Um, because what I hear from the marketplace is um, investors want to hear from, their, from CEOs, and of course they should. Yes. Um, CEOs want to share what they can within the bounds of the law, um, and of course they should. The question is how can we do that in a way that protects investors? And I think you might be right. It's time for us to say more about that. Uh, you have been a strong voice on a lot of these issues, uh, and those of us who cover the markets have appreciated that. Uh, your term has expired, technically. Am I right about that? Uh, w w can you tell me anything about your plans? I, I know you've been a little tight-lipped about it, but I'm curious to hear. What's, are you, are you going to hang around at the SEC? Are you on <laughs> to uh, new things? I'm just getting married, man. <laughs> I mean, get, get me past that and I'll be a happy guy. Okay, no, that, that's, uh, <laughs> that's absolutely, absolutely um, fair enough. Well, on that uh, extremely happy note, uh, uh, please join me in thanking Commissioner Robert Jackson for speaking with us. Thanks so much, folks. Enjoy the conference. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Rob. That was very, yeah, yeah. thank you.